Good evening to all of you. I have a few questions that have come my way, and I'm going to do the best I can to try to answer them, even though some of these questions can be lengthy in answering them. I'm going to answer the first one, which is a short one. Um, as I've been visiting, uh, there are some people who have given me some tax uh, from the book of Romans, for example, that Christ ended the law. So let me just share that with you because it's a little confusing for some people. And Paul uses language sometimes that uh, can be misunderstood. But frankly, if you really study it carefully, it makes sense. Uh, this is Romans 10 and verse 4. If you have your Bibles, we can look at it. Romans 10 and verse 4. Notice what it says. And I'm reading from the King James Version. So if your version says something different, it's because you're having a different version. The King James Version. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. And so this verse is used to show that Jesus ended the law. Now, when people give me this verse of Scripture, I always ask them questions because the best way to answer a question is by a question. And that's what Jesus did, right? Uh, I ask them, does the word end only mean to finish, to do away with? Or as I say in German, kaput. Okay. Does it mean to terminate? If it does, then we have to look at other verses of Scripture that Paul uh, writes <clears throat> and uh, others write using the same word. So let's look at a few of these words. Look at Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, verse 22. Notice it says, But now being made free from sin... And become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness, and the end everlasting life. So what does that word end mean? Does that word end means to finish everlasting life? To do away with it? No, it means the outcome. The what? The outcome, the goal of all this is everlasting life. Let's look at a few more verses of Scripture, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Uh, look in the book of James, chapter 5 and verse 11. James chapter 5 and verse 11. In that particular chapter of, of James, uh, he is making a statement that uses the word again, end. Notice James chapter 5 and verse 11. Are you there? All right. Behold, we count them happy which endure. You have heard of the patience of Job and has seen the end of the Lord. That the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. So I ask him, since you say that the word end means to finish, then who else also is finished? The Lord. And then I have another verse of Scripture. Are you ready? 1 Peter 1, 9. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 9. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 9. Notice it says, Receiving the end of your faith. Receiving what? The end of your faith. So if the word end means to finish, to terminate, then we say receiving the termination of your faith. So you have no more faith. Is that true? No. So what do these words actually mean? The word end simply means the goal or the outcome. The what? The goal or the outcome. Now if you read Romans 10 again in verse 4, it says, For Christ is the goal of the law for righteousness. Christ is the what? The goal of the Law for righteousness. So how do you become righteous? Through the law or through Christ? Through Christ. So the law points out your sin, 
which in turn makes you realize that you need righteousness, and the only way to get it is to go to who? Jesus, you see? So the law is not the caput or the end of the termination, but the law is the one pointing to your need of Christ for righteousness. Does that make sense? Yes? So there are many statements like that. Another text, for example, is in Matthew. Uh, this one, again, was shown to, to me the other night, and I'm surprised that people don't, don't somehow catch themselves in what they're saying. In the book of Matthew, it says, think not that I'm, pardon me, I'm in chapter 5, by the way, verse 17. Think not that I'm come to destroy the law or the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So he said, Jesus fulfilled it. That means he nailed it to the cross. So I said, are you certain that the word fulfill means to do away with it? He said, absolutely so. The law is done away with. I said, okay, then let's look at Matthew, same, same book, chapter 3. And let's look at that. Chapter 3 and verse 15. And here's what it says. Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to, what's the next word? Fulfill all righteousness. So if the word fulfill the law means to do away with the law, the word fulfill here means to do away with what? With righteousness. Does that make sense? Absolutely not. So when I say, so you mean righteousness is done away with? No, no, righteousness is not done away with. Then if it's not a done away with, then what does the word fulfill mean? It means to complete it, to make it full. In fact, I said, Jesus said, till heaven and earth fall, not one jot nor one tittle shall pass from the law. So I asked him, has heaven and earth fallen? He said, no. So what does that mean then? That the law is still present. I said, you acknowledge that you're a sinner, right? He said, yes. I said, then how do you know you're a sinner? Because of the law. So I said, then you just admitted that the law points out sin, and at the same time you tell me that it's done away with. So which one is it? Well, he said, I'm confused. I said, I would be too if I thought the way that you're thinking. No, I said, it's not that the law of God is done away with. You cannot do away with morality. I mean, our whole nation is based upon the Ten Commandments, and that you have a whole police force trying to enforce the commandments of God in a physical, civil manner. Don't kill, don't steal, etc. And so, no, those words mean the opposite. It means to make it full of. Make it what? Full of. And chapter 5 then explains that. You think you've heard it said in the old days, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, if you lust after a woman in your heart, you have already committed adultery. Does that sound like it's being done away with or amplifying it? It is amplifying it. Then the next uh, ticklish question that I was asked is this one. Did you hear what I said? Ticklish question. What will be the worldly events that will trigger the Sunday law? What will be the worldly events that will trigger the Sunday law? From my biblical understanding, I can uh, go to Revelation chapter 13 and read there for you what you can read for yourself. And that is that what it says is that the lamb-like beast will give its support to the beast to enforce its mark that no man might buy nor sell. Okay? So, irrespective of everything that's going on in the world today, and so many things that appear as if though it's not going to happen, as some people assume, the same thing that they assume with communism. For a long time, a lot of people believed that the Soviet Union was here to stay as a Soviet Union. And they believed then that um, it was the, the king of the north. I remember some evangelists saying there was a king of the north. 
And they came up with stories that were pretty interesting, almost convincing. But the reality is that the king of the north has never been Russia, nor will it ever be Russia, because while they thought the king of the north was the Soviet Union, all of a sudden the king of the north disappeared. So now where's the king of the north? The reality is, friends, that what the Bible says stands. I remember that when the, the euro became introduced into Europe, that a lot of people who believed in Daniel chapter 2 were challenged. And they said, now what do we do? Because the Bible says in Daniel 2 that the nations will mingle together, but they will never become one. And that person said, but now they're one. I said, do you really think they're one? Oh, yes, they have the euro. I said, do you think that makes them one? I said, go to France and speak English and see how oneness there is. Now, did you hear what I said? I said, go to France and speak what? English. Well, the first time I went to France, and I was quite naive about the civil war that's still going on, even though it ended a long time ago, and I happened to speak English. I was trying to find out how do you figure this whole train system out so I can get to Switzerland. And when I went to the information booth, and it read information at the booth, I said, may I ask you a question? Immediately the man said, no English. Well, I was stuck. I didn't know what to say. Well, if you can't speak English, what do you speak? So then I turned away, I said to my wife, well, I guess we're going to have to figure it ourselves. So we did figure it out. We got into the train and we asked a conductor whether or not we could uh, sleep in a class, a first class cabin because we had first class passes. Well, he said yes. Well, we went to sleep at 2 o'clock in the morning. The door slammed open. I mean, slammed open. And there was a French conductor yelling at us, telling us to get out of that. We didn't belong in there. So I uh, was kind of shaken by it. My wife and daughter were. So we got out, and uh, we put our suitcases in a different place. And then my wife said, you're going to let him get away with that? I said, honey, I'd like to go to sleep, thank you. <laughs> she said, honey, that man should be reported to his officers, to the officials. What he did could destroy the reputation of, of, of people here. All right. So I got up, went looking for the gentleman, and found him. And I had a, a, a writing utensil and a piece of paper. And when I caught up to him, I began to write his badge number. And immediately he broke out in English. Before, he couldn't speak a word of English. And all of a sudden, he could speak English. So if you think that the, that the people over there are united as one, you need to go and travel over there and discover it for yourself. The reality is that even though they may have the euro, uh, each nation still has its own traditions. They still have their own customs. They still have their own language. And they're very protective about their particular traditions and customs. I'm not criticizing their, their, their traditions, etc. What I'm saying is that the idea that the, the prophecy in Dana has failed because of the euro is unfounded. What the Bible does say is still true. They will mingle together. They will what? Mingle. But they shall not cleave one to another as iron does not cleave to clay. Will you say amen to that? Okay. I can give you a lot more details on that, but I need to get into the message. Uh, the answer to this question is very simple. There are several, several events that must take place in order for a Sunday law to be uh, issued. The greatest event is simply some crisis. Bring about some crisis in America, just like presently in France, where a crisis came 
and everyone was ordered to stay where? At home. Just have a crisis happen in America where the government has to issue a, a presidential order and it will be very simple to implement. In 1975, how many of you were uh, remembering what took place in 1975? There was a gas crisis, you remember that? How many of you remember that? Okay. And things became so bad that as my wife and I were driving around the Beltway in Baltimore, we turned on the radio and the governor of, of uh, Maryland issued a statement. He said, it is now determined that to open anything on Sunday is a crime. Just overnight. Okay? So, what I'm saying to you is that you don't need a lot of things to happen to get a Sunday law issued. All you need to have is an excuse. What did I say? It's an excuse. And it will happen. But there are enough things happening in this country that is leading that direction anyway. And so, just keep your eyes open because Jesus said, when you think it will not happen. It will happen. Let's pray together. Father, as we study your word, we pray for your spirit to guide and to direct us. We thank you for hearing us in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you have been to a wedding? I hope you have if you've been married. And what happens at a wedding? I've been to several weddings. I've officiated over several weddings. Uh, and in each country, they have a different way they do, they do things. In, for example, this particular country in Romania, uh, the actual wedding begins outside of the church. The bridegroom is supposed to go to the bride's home and try to find his bride and the Future in-laws are supposed to do everything they can to deter him from trying to find the bride. And so when he comes to the door, he says, uh, is my bride here? And they'll say, well, uh, why are you asking? Well, because uh, uh, this is where she's supposed to be. Did she tell you that? Well, not exactly, but... Uh, and so they go banter back and forth and back and forth. And finally... They say, you don't believe us, do you? Well, come on in and look for yourself and see if you can find her. So then he comes into the house and he goes from room to room to room to room. And if they happen to have a small house, he's in luck. If they happen to have a big house, he's going to take a long time going from room to room to room. And finally, there in the room, he finds her. And then she comes out and together they put arm in arm and there's a band waiting for them right in front of the, the house. And the band erupts into music, and then the couple walks behind the band, and the whole family follows the couple, and finally they make their way while the preacher's waiting in the church, by the way. Finally they make their way to the church, and the couple then sits down. Did you hear what I said? They sit down. You know why? Because in Romania, there's no such thing as a short wedding. This is something that you're going to relish. You understand what I'm saying? This is not something that happens every day. And so they read poems and they sing music and they play music and they read poems and they, for two hours. Now you understand why the couple that is not standing, right? Meanwhile, the preacher is. But anyway... I can testify because I had to do that. So I'm standing out there while all, all this going on. And finally the couple comes up and then the most restrictive vows, did you hear what I said? The most restrictive vows uttered by a young man and young women are done right then and there in front of the witnesses. That's when the young man vows that this young girl is going to be his wife until death do them part. 
irrespective of what happened along the way. In fact, you know the words, right? In sickness or in health, in prosperity or in adversity, for good or for bad, till death do you part. Well, that's, a, that's quite restrictive, what do you say? Isn't it? Well, just think of the, uh, did you hear the word gamble? Just think of the gamble you're taking. Why did I say that? You have no idea what's going to happen to that young lady. You hear what I'm saying, men? You have no idea what's going to happen to her. I mean, she may stand there glorious in that day, and then there's an accident happens, and her face is scarred up. Are you going to stay with her? Do you understand? Uh, and that young man, as he stands there, I can guarantee you that he's not calculating how much it's going to cost to take care of this girl for the rest of her, his life or her life. Do you understand? He's not thinking about, okay, I'm going to have to buy her shoes and clothing and take care of health care and, and get her a house and provide food. You understand? Well, that's a, that's a, a huge commitment that a young man has taken that he's going to be the provider for this woman until death do them part. Well, that can amount to millions. Is that true? You're laughing. But it is true. It is true. All you who are married for 40 or 50 years, have you taken the, sat down and taken and decided how much it has cost you to have your bride. Have you ever done that? And ladies, have you ever stood in the altar saying, oh no, I don't know if I can live with this guy for the rest of my life. I can handle him for a few weeks, but the rest of my life? Well, they don't think that way. Why don't they think that way? Because those young people have made a, up their minds that they love each other. What do you say? And out of love, the most restrictive vows are made. Out of what? Out of love. When you love somebody, it, it's not a burden. It becomes a burden when you don't love somebody. Is that true? Yes or no? Yes. And so... I can tell you that the changes that you have to make are, are also interesting. I remember the first time my wife and I, when we got married, and uh, we, we, we got married in California, by the way, in Calistoga, California, and then immediately I had to go back because I was in the Army. So we arrived back at the base, and we went to our apartment. And uh, that first week, she washed my clothing. I went to the closet to get my clothing out, you know, a shirt to put on, and it was backwards. Now, what do I mean backwards? Well, I was used to hanging my shirt with the button pointing this way. And when I went to get my shirt out, it, the button was pointing this way. Now, is that backwards? Yes or no? It is to you if you're used to having the button that way, right? And immediately I thought, why did that young lady hang my clothing backwards? I need to go and straighten her out. And then I thought, no. I said, no, she's going to be washing my clothing for the rest of her life. I won't say a thing. So I didn't say a thing. You know what I did? I changed. Why did I change? Because I loved her. Now, she didn't know about that, by the way. It was not about 20 years later that we're doing marital counseling, premarital counseling for a young couple. And I'm trying to think about so those simple things that can create tension in a couple, you know, simple things. And then that thing came up, and I told that couple, well, look, when I first got married and I explained what happened and all that, my wife was shocked. She never knew about that. So next time I went to get my shirt out of my closet, what do you suppose happened? They were backwards again. And there she was hiding in the corner, seeing what I would do. And she giggled and giggled and giggled. She said, you never told me that. I said, why did I need to tell you that? I said, you know, I loved you. 
And I decided to change the way you do things. It wasn't a big matter to me. Well, when you love somebody, then those things don't matter. Do you understand? You hear what I'm saying? So, vows that are made that are restrictive usually are made because people are willing to show their love and respect and honor to somebody that they care about. And that's the message tonight. Vows of freedom. Notice I didn't say vows of restriction. I said vows of freedom. When a person comes to Christ, there are changes that he needs to make. But the changes have to come out of a love relationship with Christ. Jesus says, if you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. It's a love relationship between a man and Christ or a woman and Christ. God does not want a relationship that's arbitrary, restrictive, but rather a relationship that has to do with, with acceptance, uh, well-meaning, support, love, patience. So Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So then the Christian begins to look for ways that will please the Lord. Just like a man tries to find a way that will please his wife. Is that true? If you love her, you're going to try to figure out those things that just bring that sparkle out of her. Is that right, Dr. Mark? Yeah. And so, it's, it's important for us to understand that love is the bond that glues people together. And so it is with Christ. In fact, look at what it says. Whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and what? And do those things that are what? Placing in his sight. So he wants us to have his mind. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. One of the things about Jesus is that he was in love with his father. Is that true? Jesus loved his father, and he always talked about his father. And he wanted us to know God as our father. So much so that when he taught us to pray, he said, pray this way, our father which art in heaven. What a wonderful Wonderful concept. What are you saying? A relationship. So, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Which means then that we ought to love him and not the things of the world. In fact, there's a text that says, love not the what? The world. And Jesus himself says, you cannot love two masters. You can only love one or the other. But you cannot love both. And so when a Christian... Uh, when a person becomes a Christian, he learns right from the get-go that this is a love relationship that has to be established and that as a result of that love relationship, he must want to walk in harmony with his Lord and turn away his attentions and affections from the things that he used to love because he needs to develop affections for the things that Jesus loves. What do you say? One of the things that Jesus loved was people. So we learn to love people. And sometimes that's hard. Especially if you grew up where I grew up. But if Jesus loved them, then you learn to love them. I used to spend my time fighting against the Italians when I was a kid. And Ron Halverson used to spend his time fighting Puerto Ricans when he was a kid. But guess what? We both became Christians. And I was baptized into the Italian, Norwegian, Scandinavian church, of all places, in Brooklyn, New York. And Ron Halverson was baptized. And what's wonderful about it is that the two gangs that used to be rivals, all right, Ron then came to a holy meeting at my a church, and my mother and my brother attended that meeting, and Ron baptized my, my mother and my brother. Praise the Lord. And... Uh, 
we always were close because we recognized that once we were enemies, but to Christ we became brothers. Did you hear what I said? So the love of Christ brings us together, not just to each other, but most importantly to God. Now, having said that then, love has some guidelines, somewhat. There has to be a skeleton to this being. Otherwise, it falls apart. So God has certain things that demonstrate or that we demonstrate that we accept his will and are willing to follow him. So there are several things. Uh, number one, it says, therefore, whether you eat or what? Or drink or whatever you do, do it to what? To the glory of God. Now, I know that some people misuse this to say you can eat anything. And I remember a lady who was a nurse uh, when I first became a Christian, I was talking to her, and she said, it doesn't matter what you eat. The stomach decides if it's good or bad. If it's not good, then it goes out. And I wondered, where in the world has she studied nursing? I don't remember a stomach having a brain. Do you? So I've heard all sorts of things in my experience, and sometimes I wonder how people come to their conclusions. When the Lord makes it plain, that if you do anything, do it to his what? To his glory. And you know that there are things that we can do that really don't bring glory to God or to anybody. So God wants us to bring glory to him in eating and drinking. So in the beginning, when God created man, God was interested in his well-being. And so as a loving father, the Lord provided a diet for man. A what? Diet for men. Now, parents, let me ask you something. As soon as your children are born, what's the, thing, what's the first thing you're thinking about in that child? Feeding it. Doing what? Is that true, mothers? Yes or no? Yeah, you want to make sure that that child was, gets fed. And the first thing you try to do is get it used to breastfeeding. Is that true? And then after a while, you want to get the best food so you can give your child and get them used to eating more solid food, etc. But you're always picking the worst, aren't you? I see them going. What are you picking? You're always a picking the best that you can give to your children. Will you say amen, ladies? All right, so the father then picked the best. And if you read Genesis 1.29, it says, I have given you every herb-bearing seed, and that which is, this has a seed in it, to you it shall be for food. The word meat means food. So what does that mean then? Everything has a seed or is a seed. For example, a cucumber. Is that a fruit or a vegetable? How many of you say vegetable? Can I see your hands? How many of you say fruit? Can I see your hands? The fruit got it. Because it's that which has a seed in it. Do cucumbers have seeds in it? All right. What about a tomato? It's a fruit. What about a bell pepper? It's a fruit, you see. All of those are part of the fruit. What about rice? It's a grain. It's a seed, right? What about corn? Yes, it's also a grain. It has the kernels that you like to eat so much. You don't eat the husk, you eat the kernel, correct? All right. What about a potato? Does it have a seed in it? No, that's a vegetable, you see? So in the beginning, man was a fruitarian. A what? A fruitarian. He ate seeds and that which had seed in it. But who was a vegetarian? Well, verse 30 tells you. And to the animals, he gave the green herb of the field. Verse 30, if you read it there. So man was a fruitarian, and animals were vegetarians. In a perfect world, for a perfect man. Which means if you want to get to the place where you are perfect, maybe you ought to think about shifting. Now, did I say something bad? No. 
No, I think, friends, that God intended to make man perfect. Look, the same, the same principle holds true in the new creation. In Revelation 22, when it speaks about the new heavens and the new earth, it says that there was a tree of life bearing what? Twelve manner of fruit. So man begins a vegetarian, and guess what? He ends up being a fruitarian. Pardon me. Man begins a fruitarian, and he ends up being a fruitarian for all eternity. Wow, what do you think? Are you excited about that? You don't sound too excited. All right, now you're saying, Pastor, does that mean I need to become a fruitarian? No. What I'm telling you is that God's ideal, what? God's ideal, he has laid out in his scriptures, in the beginning man ate fruits, grains, and nuts. It was after man fell that God added the green herb of the field to, the, to mankind because of sin. So now we eat fruits, grains, nuts, and vegetables. Now we are called vegetarians. So from fruitarians we become vegetarians. And as man continued to descend down, he then became a carnivore. What a terrible name, right? But look at what's happening. Man begins as a fruitarian, Genesis 1.29, and after he falls, he becomes a vegetarian. And the Bible says in Genesis 6.21 that all that's out there is not necessary to be eaten, but the food that is to be eaten is the word. The what? The food that's to be eaten. And the reason why that's mentioned is because God had already made that which is called clean and what? And unclean. So, in Noah's day, God told him that they would be clean and unclean animals that he should select from them uh, two of the unclean and seven of the clean, okay? And what's interesting is then that when the flood ended, what Noah offered was not unclean, but what Noah offered was only clean animals to God. So right from the beginning, God made it clear that there was something called clean and unclean, all right? Now, but man, for some reason, decided that he wanted to eat flesh. And so God then permitted man to eat flesh. And if you read Genesis 9, 3 to 5, you'll see that there would be consequences. There would be what? Consequences. And we now know today that eating flesh does have its consequences. Now, I'm not saying that eating clean flesh is sinful. Did you hear what I said? Did you hear what I said? I'm not saying that, nor does the Bible say that. But the Bible lays out the reality is that God's ideal is different than what's happening today. And that as God's children, we need to aspire to reach the ideal that he has set for us, for our well-being. Listen, there's no question. We got some medical professionals here in our midst. When people begin to have heart problems, what does the medical profession tell them not to eat? What is it, doctor? Yeah, red meat, right? And pork. Why? Because now it is established scientifically that meat does create problems. God knew it. And when man began to eat flesh, he dropped from 900 plus years to a hundred plus years. And now we, if we live to be 90, we're saying, wow, look how long he lived. My dad lived to 99. And uh, when he wakes up, I'll tell him, dad, I was hoping you'd last until a hundred. But 99, that's a long time, what do you say? He was born in March. And if he had just waited a few more months, he would have made 100 years. Now we say, that's a long time to live today. Why? Because most people live much shorter. But it is established now that the simpler your diet, the what? The simpler your diet, the better your health, and the longer you live. How long do you want to live? As long as possible. 
When you're young, you don't think about wanting to live long. I remember when I was a young lad seeing people 40 and 50 years old with a cane hobbling around New York City. I used to think to myself, man, I never want to be that old. And now I know better. God in love has given us provisions to help us to be healthy and live long. And an old Jewish proverb says, he that has health has wealth. Now, the unclean and clean thing. Jesus then, the one who was the author of the scriptures, laid out the difference between clean and unclean animals. And so, if you want to know what's clean, you go to Leviticus chapter 11. There God makes it plain. Because in the Genesis, when God spoke to Noah, he didn't say which are clean or unclean. He just said, pick the clean and the unclean, right? But he didn't say, okay, this is clean and this is not clean. This is clean. Obviously, then Noah must have known the difference. Else, how could he have picked the unclean from the clean? So it was already common knowledge to those who are following the Lord. Now, when you want to know the difference, you go to this. And what's interesting is this, that in all cases, there are always two elements that are important in deciding between the clean and the unclean. For example, the clean meat, you have to have the chewing, the cut, and the splitting the hoof, right? With the fish, you have to have the the scales and the fins, okay? So God makes it simple so even a child can understand it. And the Lord made it that way just so that you and I can have better help. God is interested in our well-being. Now, Jesus was one who didn't like to waste food. Who did not what? He did not like to waste food. My mother hated, did you hear what I said? My mother hated when people threw away food because she remembers as a little girl her parents actually starving to death. And one thing my mother never wanted to do was go back to the village where she saw her family dying off because they had no food. And so when my mother got a job, when the government, U.S. government put a, a cafeteria on our hill, to feed the poor children, my mother got a job there. And then she noticed that kids didn't eat everything that was given to them. And so my mother would collect everything and then she would go herself and go and give it to the poor. Well, she was caught and fired for doing that. But my mother just couldn't bear the thought that food was thrown away. So it got me in problems sometimes because when I went to Korea, uh, I was given food, and I began to eat the food with the chopsticks, you know, and I had a bowl of rice, and then the main table is for everybody, so you pick from the main table while you eat from your own private bowl. The bowl was about this big, okay, full of white rice. So as my mother taught me, I finished the bowl, and the lady saw me with an empty bowl. She came and grabbed the bowl and came back with a full bowl, and she did not know that I was already full, and so I thought, why did she do that? I'm finished. So I went ahead and, and cleaned the second bowl. She saw me and gave a big smile. She came and grabbed that bowl and filled it up again. And by this time I was hurting. And she came and brought back another full bowl. And I said to, the, to my translator, why is this lady bringing me a bowl? She said, well, because you're hungry. I said, what, what do you mean I'm hungry? I'm hurting. I'm stuffed. I can't eat anymore. He said, oh, you are? I said, yes, that's why I cleaned the plate. No, he said, you're not supposed to clean the plate here. If you clean the plate, it means you're still hungry. So leave some food. Well, I'm glad I learned the lesson. You understand? But that's, that's something that my mother taught me. You clean the what? The plate, you don't waste food. Christ did not waste food. So when Christ fed the 10,000, Actually, it was 5,000, in another situation, 4,000. But accordingly, if you multiply by how many people must have been there, because it only talks about men, he fed more than 10,000. 
right, at one sitting. But when he finished, there was leftover. There was what? Leftover. So what did Jesus say? Gather up the what? The fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. The Lord did not like to waste food, all right? However, he came across a situation where he met a demoniac. A what? A demoniac. And the demons then said, don't, don't do anything to us. Let us go into those pigs over there. And Jesus said, go. And they went into the pigs. And the pigs then got wild and went into the lake and they all drowned. So question, if Jesus believed pig to be good food, would he have wasted it? What's the answer? No. And so Jesus never thought the swine was for food. That's why he let it to be destroyed. Do you understand what I'm saying? In fact, it's interesting that pigs and dogs in the Bible are used as symbols of what? Apostasy. Did you know that? Notice that he allowed the, the demons to go into what? Into pigs. Then the Bible says in 2 Peter 2.22, But it happened that unto them according to the true prophet, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. The prodigal son, where does he go? He goes to the what? To the pigs. So the Bible uses swines and dogs as symbols of people who have turned away or who are not being faithful to the Lord, who are professed Christians. Who are what? Professed Christians. All right? In fact, in the book Isaiah 66, here's what it says concerning the swine. It says, For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind. When is that? When will the Lord come with with his chariot of fire. When will that be? In the second coming. Then it says, to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by the fire and by his word will the Lord plead with all flesh and the slain of the Lord shall be many. So this is speaking about what time? The end of time. But notice what happens. Who are those who are particularly singled out? They that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the gardens behind one tree in the midst, eating what? Eating swine's flesh and what else? The abomination and what else? The mouse. They shall be consumed together, saith the Lord. Notice this is speaking about people who profess to believe in God. Notice it said they sanctify. The word sanctify means make themselves holy. Do you see that? And purify themselves in the garden. So apparently then, there will be people in the final days of earth's history when the master returns who will be singled out as people who have violated the principles of God by using things that God had forbidden. Peter had a dream. And a lot of people use Peter's dream to justify eating anything. The sad thing is that they only used this to justify eating pork. But in that net, there were all sorts of things. All sorts of what? All sorts of unclean animals. There were rats and there were uh, snakes and there were all sorts of things in that. But there are people who use it only to suggest that uh, God cleaned everything. But Peter himself, when he saw the unclean beast and all that, did not understand the vision. And he himself said, I have never eaten anything common or unclean. The voice had said to him, Peter, kill and eat. And he said, I've never eaten things common or unclean. So all his life, plus the three and a half years that he spent with Christ, he had never eaten anything common or, or unclean. Which means then that the disciples of Christ never participated in partaking of anything that was common or unclean. Well, then, of course, the Holy Spirit told Peter that he needed to go with some people that came to look for him. And uh, when Peter went and met Cornelius and all those people that Cornelius had brought together, a man of faith who had been praying and an angel sent to go sing for Peter, then Peter said, you know how it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company 
or come unto one of another nation. But God has showed me that I should not call any man what? Common or unclean. This was a vision to bring to Peter the, real, the reality that God had broken down the wall of separation between the Jew and the Gentile and that the Gentiles were not common or unclean. That anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord is considered to be a child of God. And so, what about drinking? Well, the scripture also speaks about drinking. It says, wine is a mocker, and strong drink is raging. And whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Now, there's new uh, uh, studies that came out recently. I think some of you remember that, where it began to boast that it's good to drink wine for the heart. But if you actually read the research, you'll see that it is wine without the alcohol. But they did not make it clear. So people thought that as long as you drink alcoholic beverages, you'll have a better heart and a stronger heart. And let me say this. My uncle, who was an, an alcoholic, had a strong heart, but his mind was gone because of alcoholism. I don't, I don't want a good strong heart with a burnt out brain. And every shot of alcohol, how many? Every shot of alcohol destroys from 15 to 20,000 brain cells. How much? 15 to 20,000 brain cells. And I'll tell you what, I need all the ones that I have. What do you say? Yes. And so, the scripture is clear. Jesus himself did not drink wine. When Jesus was on the cross suffering, and they offered him wine, they said they gave him to drink wine mingled with what? With myrrh. But he what? He received it not when it was permissible, if there was ever a time for Jesus to drink wine, it would have been when he was suffering excruciating pain. And yet when they offered it to him, the Bible said he received it not. Our Lord did not participate with that which has destroyed so many homes, so many lives, so many people. I think some of us may uh, be victims of growing up in a home where our dad or mom was an alcoholic. My dad was. He, was, he drank a lot, always drinking. And as a result, always, always abusive in the home. Yes, alcohol has been a terrible curse to mankind. And it has brought so many woes, so many broken homes, so many broken lives. And that's why Jesus has counseled us not to use it. Know ye not that you're the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. God wants to keep these temples clean. What do you say? And we need to do everything we can to keep it clean. Well, what about the appearance of a Christian? We talked about what you eat. And what's interesting is this. The Bible makes it clear that the most difficult area of the Christian life is yielding to that which God tells you not to do. All of us want to be saved. Is that true? If we say, how many of you want to be saved? What would you say? All of you. If I say, how many of you want to go to heaven? How many would you raise your hand? Yeah, all of you. If I say, how many of you want to do what God tells you to do? Well, we may raise our hand until we decide and discover what it is that we're supposed to do or not do. So let's look at, at the... Christian dress. First of all, I want you to notice that in the Genesis, in creation, in that perfect world, God did provide what we call precious stones and gold. Notice it says in Genesis 2, verse 11 and 12, there is gold, there is bilium, and the onyx stone. In other words, just like God created the flowers, God also created the gold and the precious stones for the purpose of beauty. For the purpose of what? Beauty. And all of this was on the ground. Where was it? On the ground. It was not on Adam and Eve. There's no record that Adam and Eve were clothed or garbed with stones. The record makes it plain then that the stones and the gold were on the ground. Also, in the new earth, where will the gold and the stones be? Again, on the ground. 
They will not be on the saints. There it says the streets and walls are of transparent gold. The foundations garnished with what? Precious stones. God uses those things to, to uh, decorate our surroundings. Praise God for that. What do you say? I love flowers. And before I became a Christian, I couldn't understand why people talked about beautiful flowers. I thought they were kind of dingy. You understand? But when I became a Christian, then I could see the beauty of a tree, the loftiness, the height, the splendor of all that God has made to surround our earth with beauty. God is a lover of beauty. What do you say? And so he made beautiful things, but he made them for us to enjoy, to look at, to behold to wonder with awe concerning the love of God that he would decorate things so. So in the beginning and in the new beginning, you'll find the same thing. The jewels are where? Not on the people, but on the ground. Okay, so we a simple chart. In the beginning, for example, you find the gold on the ground. Mankind is clothed, and there's a perfect diet. But mankind's declining diet and his standards. When Jesus Christ came, Jesus Christ was clothed in modest apparel, and Jesus clothed the naked as well. Is that true? But then it says that in the new earth, the gold and the jewels will again be on the ground. Mankind will again be clothed, and there will again be a perfect diet. So if that's the truth, in the beginning, if that's the truth in the new beginning, then where are we today? We're someplace in the middle. So we either have to go backwards or forward. We obviously can't go backwards, so which way do we go? We must go forward. We must press toward the goal that God has set for us to become as he has uh, uh, made it clear to us. So Adam and his wife, God made coats of skin. God made what? Coats of skin. Now, please understand that that phrase where it says the man and his wife were naked is marital language. It has nothing to do with Adam streaking around the garden. Did you hear what I said? Adam and Eve were not naked in the garden. The language is marital language. That's why it says the man and his wife were naked and were not ashamed. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Marital language. And unfortunately, people have made it as if though Adam and Eve were without clothing in the garden. The reality is that they were clothed with, with the righteousness, with bright light, we understand. And when they fell, they lost that light. But that light will be regained because the Bible tells us that they will have Robes of what? Of righteousness. He that overcometh the same shall be what? Clothed with what? In white raiment. You see that. So if in for eternity you're going to have clothing, you know that in the beginning you had clothing also. It's man in sin that had become naked. And Jesus has come to clothe our nakedness with his perfect righteousness. Hallelujah. What do you say? So we need to understand. And that's why you have two women. You have a woman in Revelation 12 that's clothed with the sun, S-U-N. And that's from Malachi chapter 4, where it says that Jesus will arise, the sun of righteousness will arise with healing in his winds, representing Christ as being the sun of righteousness, the S-U-N. A woman clothed with the sun, a crown of 12 stars representing the 12 messengers, the apostles and standing on the moon, representing the shadows and types of the Old Testament. But then in Revelation chapter 17, there's another woman. And this woman is uh, arrayed in purple and scarlet color and dark and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. Complete opposites, one representing the bride of Christ, one representing an apostate faith. Which one would you rather be? The bride of Christ, amen. Listen. Having said that, then that's why Jesus gives us counsel concerning 
how we appear, how we adorn ourselves. And so in Genesis 35, God is telling Jacob that he needs to go and worship and uh, and, uh, establish an altar. When Jacob talked to his family, if you read in in Genesis 35, verse 1 through 4, you'll find then that Jacob says to his family, put away the strange gods that are among you, and you need to change your garment and be cleansed. Okay? So wash, change your garment. So we're going to go to God, we're going to worship him, we must put away our strange gods, we must change our clothing, because we're going to be appearing before the holy God of Israel. Now, when he said that to them, the Bible says that their response was this, they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand, and all their earrings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the yoke which was by Shechem. So according to the scriptures then, they understood that their rings, their earrings, etc., were considered to be what? Strange gods. Something that I was convicted about the first time I uh, had an experience with the Lord. I had ten rings, one on each finger. As soon as I had, was converted, I was immediately struck with a sensation that something was wrong. What I had on my fingers did not represent the lowly Jesus. And I immediately took them off and threw them in the garbage can. I don't know how much they were worth, but let me tell you this. Not too long ago, a woman called me up wanting to talk with me. She was the only woman in the higher echelons of Playboy. She was the only woman in the higher echelons of Playboy. She called me because she wanted to ask me some counsel. So my wife went with me there in Colorado, going up toward Vail. Those of you who know anything about that area, you know it's a very ritzy area. So we went and climbed up into her condo. And she sat down, she began to cry. And she said, I was one of the top executives of Playboy, the only woman. And she said, I love jewels. And I spent hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars in buying jewelry. And then she brought them out. I can tell you what the gorgeous things. I had never seen jewelry that expensive and actually hold them in my hand. I mean, a ring costing $500,000 for a ring. That's a pretty pricey ring, what do you say? Diamond earrings, watches with diamonds and, sp- and stones, etc. She had it all. She had the rings, she had the earrings, she had the, the bracelets, she had the necklaces, gorgeous necklaces. She said that at some, once I adored these things. I couldn't wait to put them on and go out so people can look at them and see the beautiful things that I had on me. She said that was the case until I fell in love with Jesus. When I fell in love with Jesus, I felt something was wrong with all this. I could no longer feel comfortable wearing them, and I took them off. And she said, now I have no use for them. Pastor, she said, The reason why I called you is to ask you advice. Is it right for me to sell this to others and cause them to fall? That's a tough decision, isn't it? She said, is there some way, Pastor, that I can get rid of these in a way that it would not cause somebody to fall? And at the same time, the money that I get out of them, put it into God's work and build a church right here near Bell so that people can come and worship the Lord of heaven. She said, I no longer have a relish, a desire, or a willingness to follow this anymore. I'm free, she said. And what? I'm free. And when she said that, I could remember 
the, the statements that I made, vows of freedom. It's such a joy to be free. But you don't appreciate the freedom, freedom until you understand that you've been in bondage. And many people have been in bondage. They've been in bondage either by what they take inside, what they do, how they dress, what they eat. But the Lord came to deliver them so that they can be free. That's why Jesus says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, I should tell you this. There's only one being in all of Holy Writ that was made with jewels. Only one. You know who that was? Lucifer. Who was it? Lucifer. And I believe, I believe, that the reason why he tempts people to deck themselves out is so that they could reflect him rather than the lonely Galilean who sacrificed everything, heaven itself, so that you and I could be saved. He was a very simple person. He loved simplicity. He loved the lilies, and he spoke about the lilies. He loved little children. He spoke about little children. He loved the simple things of life, and he encourages us as Christians to also love the simple things of life, to be free from those encumbrances, to be free. I remember one lady who was coming to one of my seminars, and every night she came in with a different set of earrings, bracelet, necklace, and ring matching her outfit. Every night she had a different outfit with matching ring, bracelet, earring, and necklace. Every single night. And so I sat with her one evening and I said, my sister, I notice that every night you come with a different attire and matching jewelry. She said, I'm a jewelaholic. I'm a what? A jewelaholic. What a sad statement. To be an alcoholic is bad. To be a jewelaholic is bad. But she loved her jewelry so much that it was more important to her than her salvation. There was a lady. The great volcano in Italy had erupted. And when it erupted, Everybody fled for their lives. Mount Eusebius had exploded. The lava was coming down, and people were fleeing for their lives. But there was one woman who, upon leaving, remembered she forgot something, ran back inside, grabbed what she forgot, and as she was making haste, she got overtaken by the lava lost her life. Centuries later, they began to excavate, and they found that this body covered and crusted with lava. They began to chip away, but they noticed her hands were f closed. And they chipped away and finally came to her skeleton. They wondered why her hands were closed. Did she have some uh, disease that kept her hands closed? What was it? But when they opened up her hands, they discovered diamond earrings, one in one hand and one in the other, clutched in her hands. If she had only fled when she first ran out of her house, she would have been saved. But she ran back to get that which brought death to her. That's why Jesus appeals to us. Love not the world, neither the things of the world. 
love the Lord. God wants us to make the inside beautiful. And I'm not saying by that that you should look like scarecrows. Rather, we ought to do the best to make the best of ourselves for the sake of Christ, what do you say? But at the same time, we ought to put our emphasis where it belongs, in the heart, to become more and more like Jesus. Do you want to become more like Christ? Do you? Then we must be willing to let go of whatever it is that would keep us back, whatever that may be. I love the old song that says, be like Jesus all day long, in the home or in the throng. Be like Jesus, be like Jesus, be like Jesus. In fact, it says, I will be like Jesus. How many of you want to be like Jesus tonight? Amen. And so, Let's follow his example. Let's follow his counsel. Let's do the best we can to focus where the focus must be, on the inward man. And as we do, God will bless us and use us to his glory. That woman who gave up all her joy, um, she is a saint of a lady today. You would have never known if you had met her today that she ever had any part to play with Playboy. God has refined that woman and has made her a beautiful person. Not with the jewelry, but on the contrary, without it. Praise God, what do you say? God is willing to do the same for all of us if we follow him, the lowly Jesus of Galilee. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for so much for the good counsel that you give us. We can see from end to beginning the consistency of your holy word. We're thankful that Jesus focused so much on the inner, the soul, the character, the personality of the person. So much so that he discouraged outward adornment. And as we try to follow in his steps, help us to focus where he delights us to focus. Make us more like him, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.